when we were talking about diversity of food and the importance of that for the microbiome, you did mention meat. And classically, when people talk about eating a diverse rainbow of colors, they're referring to fruits and vegetables to get, you know, that diversity within the microbiome. So let's talk about the animal protein piece and how that fits in and how important that is in the full spectrum of building up the microbiome. Yeah, I, I to me, you know, I mean, protein is an important component in itself, right? In and in two different ways. So there are microbes that will metabolize proteins themselves and 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 utilize them for energy and growth and producing byproducts and so on. So so they do directly feed certain uh, species within the gut microbiome. But then um, microbes also need amino acids to function. Right, just as our cells need amino acids, so providing those amino acids to the to the microbial community becomes really important. If your protein intake is really low and you're not providing your microbiome with adequate amino acids, it can't build its protein structures. Right, microbes are constantly making proteins, uh, and in part making proteins for us that we utilize. Uh, enzymes are all proteins, right? So microbes are making enzymes all the time to break down things like carbohydrates. But in order for the microbe to, to be able to produce the enzyme, which breaks down the carbohydrate, which then allows the microbe to utilize the carbohydrate, that enzyme is made up 100% of protein, right? So the microbe needs access to amino acids. Uh, and it can't necessarily synthesize its own amino acids uh, because there are, there are a number of amino acids that can't be synthesized from any other starting material, right? So you can look at protein both those ways. One, as a way of feeding the microbes where they directly utilize the protein. Number two is supporting microbial systems that require amino acids. Um, I always like to get as much diversity in the amino acids as well, right? So there's something called the PDCAS score of amino acids. Mother's milk is thought to be like the most ideal diversity in, in, in protein profile in terms of the different types of amino acids that are there. So mother's milk would have a PDCAS score of one, right? That's an ideal protein, meaning it has all the essential amino acids and everything else you need. Um, now, anything that's, let's say it's PDCAS of 0.98, that means it's a 98% similar to mother's milk. There are some proteins that are over a one, which means it's even more diverse in terms of uh, amino acids and then mother's milk. And so as I'm looking at my dietary proteins and I supplement proteins as well because I lift, right? So if, if I'm if I'm lifting, if I'm doing resistance training, it's really great to get a, a big dose of free amino acids in your system after you lift. Studies show that the moment you're done with the workout routine, if you increase the amount of free amino acids in your system, it creates this, this myogenic uh, activation, which is that activation of muscle building, right? So for that reason, I supplement protein. But when I eat protein and I eat protein from animal sources, I try to get a diversity in that too. So lean beef, right? Uh, pork has different amino acids than beef does. Chicken, uh, lean fish. I, I love fish and I love a lot of lean fish. I love sushi, for example. So I try to eat a lot of sushi grade fish. I try to get a diversity of the protein uh, from those as well. Now you also get other compounds that come along with it. You get peptides, you get nutrients, micronutrients like vitamins and certain minerals that come within the, that protein as well. Um, and at the end of the day, one of the things that we have to we have to accept because diet becomes very uh, polarizing, right? And it's one of those very difficult topics to talk about because for some reason people become very activist-like about their diet choices, right? Whether they are paleo or um, keto or vegan or vegetarian, whatever it is they choose, whatever camp they're in, they're very um, activist-like about their, their position on it. The fact of the matter is humans are omnivores, right? All the evidence we have in terms of our physiology, our guts, our microbiomes, looking at other species that are similar to us in the environment, they're all omnivores. They're, room, they're, they're roaming omnivores, right? Um, just a couple of uh, pieces of evidence for that. So if you just look at our dental uh, structures, we have both incisors and we have, uh, we have masticating teeth and we have canines that, that can cut meat, right? Very few uh, mammals have both, right? Unless they eat both meat and they eat vegetation where they need uh, grinding 
capability and they need cutting capability as well. Uh, if you look at our digestive tract, so when, when the herbivores, obligate herbivores tend to have multiple stomachs, right? Because they have four or five different stages of fermentation to be able to utilize all of those uh, plant-based materials fully and effectively. We don't utilize a lot of the components within plants very well. And so we have what, what we call a medium length gut with a big fermentation at the end, right? Our small intestines is more predominant than our large bowel in terms of length and size. Um, and that's because fermentation is secondary to assimilation of nutrients. And that's because we can assimilate nutrients from lots of different sources, right? If you look at, um, if you look at carnivores, obligate carnivores, they have much shorter guts and they don't have as much fermentation in their system, right? So there's lots of evidence. And you look at uh, the, the animal that actually has the most similar microbiome to a human is a baboon actually. So we are genetically closest to chimpanzees, right? We're like 98%, almost 99% similar in genetics to chimpanzee. And yet our microbiomes are actually quite a bit different than chimpanzees. Our microbiomes are much closer to baboons. The reason for that is baboons are much more omnivor uh, omnivorous than chimpanzees are, right? Baboons hunt, they eat meat, they pick, they forage, they eat insects, they dig, they eat roots and tubers. They also roam right? They move in tribes, in, in groups, and they roam throughout environments similar to what humans did. And that's why their microbiomes have evolved similar to ours. Given what you just said about humans being an omnivores, there is this growing trend of people in the health world only consuming meat, or you mentioned carnivore there, going on a carnivore diet. And seemingly, they've been doing really well when it comes to healing from chronic disease. Have you looked specifically at the microbiome piece, somebody that's been on that type of diet over a long period of time and what happens? And you mentioned before the fasting piece, we could maybe tie that in at the end because that would be a pivot where we're actually giving no food to the microbiome. In this case, we'll start with just meat. Yeah, so, so there are some studies coming out that show that if you go full keto, for example, or full carnivore, it starts to really impact the diversity of the microbiome and it doesn't take a lot of time. It can be three months to six months where you start to see a reduction in the diversity of the microbiome, which means if you look at all of the studies on the importance of diversity and longevity, so you can actually predict someone's longevity based on the diversity of the microbiome at a given age, right? It's one of the most uh, accurate and best predictors of longevity and re disease resilience. So. That kind of diet, reducing diversity, even though you may see certain short-term improvements, and we'll talk about why you might see short-term improvements, but because it reduces diversity, to me, that's a long-term misstep, right? I think you will pay for it down the road. Now, why is it that people go carnivore and then they start to lose weight, they feel better, the metabolism, they the have less inflammation, and so on? Well, part of that is because on a carnivore diet, there are a couple of things that'll happen. Right. Number one, you're basically eliminating sugar from your diet. Right. And it's easy to eliminate sugar when you go on a carnivore diet because you don't have any options that actually have sugar in it. Right. Unless, of course, you're mistakenly eating like, you know, fast food meat that is marinated in sugar based marinades and all that. But that's not what the people are doing. Right. When they're when they eat carnivore, they're roasting chicken, they're eating turkey, they're just eating steak for the most part. Uh, and you're just grilling or or, or uh, cooking steak, smoking steak, and eating it with a little bit of salt on it, right? That becomes an easy way to eliminate sugar. That's one of the reasons why people's systems start to get better. They start to lose weight. You also reduce caloric intake, right? Because a carnivore diet is very high in protein. Protein provides a lot of satiety, right? And so you don't actually overeat. So you end up with caloric restriction and almost no sugar in your diet, you're going to lose weight, right? And when you lose weight, inflammation comes down, right? So that's all a beneficial thing. And maybe you can do it for two, you know, two, three weeks. Maybe you can do it for a month, right? And just to get your metabolism and kick started in some way and kind of get yourself feeling better. Let's say it's early spring now and you're like, oh, I want to get into bathing suit shape, right? Maybe you can kickstart that with going carnivore for a little bit. And that, that might give you enough 
effect that keeps you motivated, right? But if you do that forever, if you do that for six months, eight months, 10 months, 12 months, you're going to start reducing the, the diversity of your microbiome, and that will have health implications down the road, right? How do you feel about using that as a kickstart if somebody's coming to this conversation, eating a standard type diet and their microbiome's a total mess? You mentioned it more in a general sense being a kickstart, but can you see that being a good way to balance out the microbiome before taking on a lot of the principles we're talking about today? I think it could be. I think it could be, especially if someone's diet was a mess before. They've had lots of antibiotic uh, courses. Um, and let's say they have low diversity already, right? Um, their pathobionts tend to be high, which means they're probably sensitive to a lot of foods anyway, right? So a lot of, uh, a lot of plant-based foods uh, may actually cause them distress because their systems aren't, aren't capable of handling it. So, so in that case, you could eliminate a lot of those things, go carnivore for a short period of time, I would say three, four weeks, right, to kind of start to reset your system. You, your diversity is not going to improve in any way at that point, you know, but, but your assist, you might feel better and your system might start to function a little bit better, but then you want to start adding in other foods relatively quickly, but at small amounts. Right. So I would go if I was doing this, I would I would go, OK, I'm going to go carnivore for three weeks. Uh, at the end of that three weeks, I'm going to start adding in some nuts, some seeds. I'm going to start adding in some polyphenol. So a, a, a serving of fruit with my meal. Right. I might need a steak still, but I might have steak with blueberries to finish it off. Right. So start bringing in the diversity of food slowly. Because keep in mind that our bodies can, uh, can adapt, our microbiomes can adapt to almost any diet that you put it through, and it'll find a way to function. It's not going to function well, but it'll find a way to give you basic functionality. But if you start adding in all the right foods at slow amounts, uh, at, a, at a certain pace, you'll start to diversify your microbiome and start to build that resilience. So I think it could be, you know, I would just... If, if it makes people feel better, makes them lose a little bit of weight, get more energy and so on, um, you know, I think it's fine. But long term, it's not something I would do. I just I just heard, you know, Joe Rogan on, on a podcast, he was talking about when he went carnivore. He did it for about a month. Right. And he said he lost weight. He became leaner. But the problem he was having was he was having an energy issue. If when he did hard workouts or longer workouts, he just he was wiped out. He had no energy. Right. Of course, because you need carbohydrates or energy. You need to build your glycogen storage. You need to build like muscle glycogen, liver glycogen. That's what's going to give you a lot of energy throughout the day. Your brain uses a lot of carbohydrates. So you can end up going ketonic and start making more ketones. But your brain is actually naturally designed to use a lot of carbohydrates for normal respiration and ATP production. So you don't want to necessarily do that for long term, but maybe it's a kickstart. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. Adding spores to a gut microbiome in three weeks increased the diversity of the gut microbiome by almost 25 to 30%. And it increased the growth of keystone species and it brought down pathogens. So the spores are like the police or the orchestrator.